I think it's more about when something seems off to you. Mm -hmm. or regardless of who the person is, you know, regardless of identifying the person, knowing who to watch out for. Are you talking about in your dream or in life? It never yeah. It works in such a beautiful way because you can take the lead paragraph wherever Plotinus is doing an essay. And you can see the opening paragraph in each numerically identified section represents the subject. So you can just open up and take a look at what's the opening sentence on section one. What section is it? Contemplation uh, of section read one. Read it? Yeah, just the first. If before beginning a serious investigation we were suggesting me to say that all beings are striving after contemplation, not merely those endowed with reason, but unreasoning animals... Uh, well. Oh, hey, 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 I forgot to tell you. Hey, I, uh, <laughs> I heard a, uh, a great dirty joke, and uh, what happens to you? I laugh. Right? Yeah. You wake up? Perk up. Mm -hmm. up. Right? Everyone perks up? Yeah. See? Joking is contemplation. That's the way he starts the sassai. Right? Joking, telling a joke, jesting is, is contemplation. See? People wake up, they focus their mind, they wait for the punchline, they're going to enjoy it. That's where he starts. Second section. <coughs> Clearly, nature does not have hands or feet or any natural or artificial tools. All nature, even though it has no hands or feet, nonetheless is an act of contemplation. Three. Being a productive agent and pro productive in this particular way, how does nature how achieve does nature contemplation? Achieve contemplation? Huh. Five. Four. Were one to ask nature why it produces, it might, if willingly, thus reply, you should never have put the question. So look here, one, two, three, four, five brings you to the subject, right, in a very beautiful way. Right, from joking to the processes of nature being a kind of contemplation. Then, now notice the shift in six. Now we go into us, humans. All action is contemplation. Everything is contemplation. Hey, nature is a contemplation. Soul is a contemplation. Intelligence is a contemplation. As it proceeds through each of these, it becomes more uh, intimately one's own. Nine. Hey, from intelligence where? To the one or the good. Then he concludes with ten and eleven. So, if you want to get into it, you can take this or jump here and then take the last two. So, my thought is would go six, seven, eight, nine, then you'll enjoy one, two, three, four, five. We'll come back and do 10 and 11. All right, take a look first. <clears throat> he starts on a great line. <clears throat> <coughs> the point of action is contemplation and having an object of contemplation. Contemplation, therefore, is the end of action. <clears throat> right. I remember being shocked when I was a kid when someone said to me, well, I don't know what I'd do without work. <laughs> I knew I was strange. I couldn't believe it. But see, for work for him was a way in which he could devote his mind, he could direct his mind, he could direct his activities. Then to him, life had meaning so long as he could then follow the trail of work. My, 
I have the problem that my father raised me to be a gentleman, but never left me enough money to be one. <laughs> you have the same problem? Yep. Yeah. I sure understand that. <laughs> Action seeks to achieve indirectly what it cannot achieve directly. When one has achieved the object of one's desires, it is evident that one's real desire was not the ignorant possession of the desired object, but to know it as possessed, as actually contemplated, as within one. Now, in that phrase, he's telling you what he means by contemplation, right? You have to have an object, you have to know it is possessed, <coughs> as actually engaged and reflected upon and seeing it and as becoming one with it. Oh, there it is. But to know it as possessed, as actually contemplated, as within one. Yeah, right? Take this. a great writer, isn't it? Very great writer. Action always has some good or other in view. Right. A good for oneself as possessed. Possessed where? In the soul. Then circuit, it's complete. Through action, the soul comes back to contemplation. Now for him, it's got this, this got a goal, have an object, action, when it's achieved, you go back and start over again. But what is there then in the soul itself? essential reasonableness, but an inexpressible reasonableness. And it's there the more, the more reasonable it is. Then the soul rests, it seeks no further. It's sated. Its vision remains all within. It's sure of its object. The greater this assurance, the more tranquil will is the contemplation, the more united the soul, knower and known, they're one. Hey, I mean this seriously, were they two? Be different. They would lie as it were side by side in their duality, unassimilable by the soul, much as certain notions <laughs> exist in the soul without producing effect. So here it is now. To learn, we must not allow ideas to remain exterior to us, but fuse with them until they become part of our existence. When this is done and our dispositions correspond, the soul is able to formulate and make use of them. It comprehends now what, is, what, what it merely contained before using them, the soul becomes, as, as, as it were, different. Only upon reflection does it find them to be aliens. Right? That's the goal. That's learning. See, that's learning. Right? That's learning. Right, when you learn a language, you want to see through the language, don't you? Right? Anything you really want to see, you want it to be effortless, and seeing it naturally without any need to stumble. Right. Nevertheless, the soul is rational. Yeah, the soul itself is rational. A kind of intelligence. Not intelligence, a kind of intelligence. But an intelligence that sees an object as different from itself. <coughs> it does not possess fullness and is deficient compared with its prior. I like this now. Yet, it beholds in silence 
what it expresses in words, because verbal formulation is only of what it has already seen. If it speaks, it is because it is deficient and needs to inquire in order to know what it is it contains. Right? The soul is richer and content in content than, than nature is, and so it's more at rest and more contemplative. But as its possessions are not complete, it wants to increase the knowledge of its object and the contemplation that comes from inquiry. Even while withdrawn from its own higher part and involved in the variety of things only to return to itself later, the soul contemplates with its remaining higher part. The soul that abides within itself does this the less. Thus it is that uh, the wise man is penetrated by reason and has wholly within himself what he manifests to others. He contemplates himself. He achieves unity and immobility not only in regards to external objects, but also in regard to things within himself. He finds all things within himself. Therefore, it follows good enough. <coughs> so everything derives from contemplation, and everything is contemplation. Right? Pretty good, interesting guy. Mm -hmm. So is it fair to say that the, that the aim or the goal of contemplation is unity with its object? Of contemplation. Yeah, have you ever known people who uh, are willing to sit in a chair for long periods of time and uh, they just sit in it and, and uh, they write occasionally, but they direct all of their attention on what someone else is saying, <clears throat> no matter how boring it is, and they do that for years? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Contemplation. Yeah. They only do it for one reason. What's the reason? Get a degree. <laughs> they want to get a degree. Yeah, right? So they get, right? Calluses on their ass and eye strain in their head. But essentially, what are they doing? Well, before they're 18, they have to. Right? <laughs> Seriously? Yeah, it's not about a degree of <laughs> <laughs> But would you agree, this person will do this for many years? Right, right. Wow. All for what reason? He believes after a certain period of time, he'll get a degree, and that might get him a better job. Likely that he'll be bored in for the rest of his life. But nonetheless, <laughs> he will go ahead and do it. <laughs> Unless someone, or it might come about, someone will say, by the way, everything in your study no longer exists. It's gone. Yeah. Then what happens? Um, all school. of that, all of that <laughs> focusing his attention and contemplating the words and trying to become one with it so he can then function with it. Why is it going? So he can then see through the knowledge and act with it. Agree? Okay? And get a go, um, get some kind of status or money or both. <laughs> Unless he wants to get into pharmacy, and that's the highest profession I've heard. Is that true? Uh, no. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> so look here. How much of what he just said can we put in here? Well, <coughs> a lot. Yeah. Yeah. To learn, we must not allow ideas to remain exterior to us, but to fuse with them until they become part of our existence. 
right? We identify with what it is we've learned. When this is done and our dispositions correspond, the soul is able to formulate and make use of them. It comprehends now what it merely contained before. Using them, the soul becomes, as it were, different. Only upon reflection does it recognize something. It might find them to be alien. Right? So then, through this long course of work, right, it shapes them. It's an act of contemplation. Now look, um, that all depends upon whether or not the person sees that as still meaningful and worthwhile. Otherwise, he's going to leave, won't he? Right, there has to be some perceived good. Yeah, yeah. If you're going to perceive it as good and worthwhile, he'll continue this contemplation. Yeah. But Pierre, doesn't that kind of imply the object of contemplation? Pardon, do it loud. The object of contemplation has to be, you know, something that is associated, you know, with something worthwhile. Yeah. Yeah, whether it is or not, example, doesn't matter. Yeah, yes. the, the, the process mm -hmm. can, you know, we can contemplate, you know, the creation of ovens in mm -hmm. Auschwitz, you know, as part of our contemplation, as you were pointing out to me earlier. And they can, you know, be what we contemplate. So mm -hmm. you're, what you're implying here is we have to do something about what we contemplate. Yeah. We're not yet in the intelligible yet. No, no, I know. No, no, not yet. He's going to go there in a couple of steps. Okay. So therefore, I look, anything then that is that has and grows and moves towards anything, the whole idea of evolution is nothing other than nature contemplates. That's in the earlier section. So he carries one, two, three, four, five with him. He talked about action. Action, therefore, is nothing other than contemplation. If everything then is in motion and struggling and moving towards some goal, then everything is a contemplation and that becomes section seven. Right? So everything derives from contemplation. And everything is contemplation. This truth holds for the truly real beings, as well as for the beings that they bring into existence by their contemplation, and that are objects of contemplation, either for sensation or for knowledge and opinion. That's his thesis, see? First paragraph, always. Actions and desires, as well, aim at knowledge. Begetting originates in contemplation and ends in the production of a form that is a new object of contemplation. All things as images of their generating principles universally produce forms and objects of contemplation. Begotten existences being imitations of truly real beings show that the purpose of generation is neither generation nor action, but the production of works that are to be contemplated. Look at that. See, all things as images of their generating principles universally produce forms and objects of contemplation. My friend here, <coughs> what's he going to do? He's trying to He's trying to build himself to be something, see? He's hoping here. <clears throat> so long as he has this on his mind, the value of this, B.A., or whatever else it is, to the degree that he's focused on this and sacrifices for it and puts all his energies in trying to achieve that, <coughs> then this is an act of contemplation. And he's molding himself to be this. This is a molding. I'm shaping. That's what we're doing, molding and shaping. We're, we're like sculptors of ourselves as we pick the object of our contemplation, the thing we most desire, 
focus on it, keep our mind focused on it, sacrifice for it, until we can finally become one with it, so then you're, you are the thing that you've studied, you see through it. Believe it or not, some people even learn languages. They do that, go to college, learn a language. Then they see through their language, it becomes part of them. Mathematics, they finally want to see through mathematics, don't they? They want to see through it, be able to understand through it, or psychology or philosophy or anything else. Or midwifery. What? Mid what? Or midwifery. Is that a guy who's not sure whether he's married or not? No. Whose <laughs> <laughs> divorce is pending. No? Okay, I thought I'd ask. <laughs> yeah. I just got that. <laughs> See, you joke? What's that? Contemplation? See? You chuckle over it. You wake up, yeah, man, that's great, that's funny. Ah, right? All action and speech. Right. True. Is this, is this another way of Plotinus backing into the, you know, the looking at the shadows? The principle? Yeah, backing into it? I got the image. Right, backing into it, yeah. you know, looking at the shadows? Yeah. Oh, mm. Hey, everyone in the allegory of the cave, they're all, they're all contemplating, they're all contemplating oh, the yes, shadows. Yes, Some people get prizes because they know in what order they come in and can anticipate one or the other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're all doing the same thing. We have different objects. Uh-oh. Mm -hmm. And it's not the doing that counts, but it's also what it is, you're, the object that you're choosing to do it with and on and become, except for women. Also for women? I would think so. Okay. If she only thinks so, so <laughs> that's not necessarily true. Nice. Okay. Most objects of contemplation have many parts. So yeah, in yeah. The, so VA, uh, we can put all the subjects in here. Yeah. So one must contemplate each of the parts. Yes. And, and then also unify them yeah, into the whole. Yeah. But bring them in together into a unity. Quite true. Right. So in another sense, it's union or unification. That's yeah. that's a union. Ultimately, what you're striving for. Becoming a one with it. <clears throat> yeah, quite true. Jump in. I, I was uh, looking at contemplation uh, because we are mostly pick up on family values and society values, and you know, just have a mirror part about the self. I thought that I, I figured that contemplation would mainly be others to values, not just your own. Mostly others to values. Like I was told years ago what I should do in order to be successful through the family. And I, I, I don't have to work hard digging dishes and stuff like that. If you work hard, you're keeping that object on your mind, mm -hmm. trying to do your best to achieve it. Right. That's contemplating, says it. Yeah, but it's, uh, it's other people's values. Yeah. Suppose someone were to come along and say to this fellow, Hey, I understand your uh, <clears throat> object of contemplation is to get a BA. Suppose you were to find out that you want to get the... What is the reason you want to get the BA? Oh, I think I'll be... Uh, happy. Happy. <clears throat> you say, wait a minute. Suppose you could be even more happy without going through all that but doing something else. If he could see that possibility, he might in fact change this goal. Because everything he's doing is for that goal. Therefore, hey, all of this action, all of this action, all of this involvement, nothing other than contemplation. But if he finds that there's a better object, he'll drop this, do something else. Yeah. Jump in. Well, I said that mainly because of like, when I'm going to school, I mean, the things they ask us who we want to be, I mean, from kindergarten on up, kindergarten on up, I, I never wanted to be any of the stuff they talked about. They never had no interest in me. I didn't care to be a doctor. I didn't care to be a lawyer. I don't want, I don't want any of that stuff in my life. Okay. It was all what society said to, to do to be successful. 
So that was the only reason that I participated in it, but the real me never cared for it. That's why I brought that up. Yeah. Igmar, you were agreeing? I noticed you're agreeing with it. That's interesting that you noticed it. Louder? I said it's interesting that you noticed it and called attention to it. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, well, what Tony was just describing sounds like the students that I was trying to teach in class today, which seem awful unlike the student you're describing up there. We can contemplate that. Becoming one with the ideas, I don't think so. <laughs> well, but they are one with their ideas. Yeah. yeah. We're contemplating some. <laughs> Yeah. Trying to see the world through the ideas I was trying to get him into, not mm -hmm. quite. <laughs> Maybe a couple of them, white ones. Okay, why don't you pick it up from there and read for us? Where are we at? Actions. Actions and desire as well aim at knowledge. Agree? Actions, desire as well aim at knowledge. Begetting originates in contemplation and ends in the production of a form that is a new object of contemplation. Well, nice way of talking about making love. Isn't it? See, take a look, see? Begetting originates in contemplation and ends in the production of a form that is a new object of contemplation. Or any creative or artistic. Also, baking. Yeah. <coughs> right, baking. Or many other kinds of production, is it not? All things as images of their generating principles universally produce forms and objects of contemplation. Begotten existences, being imitations of truly real beings, show that the purpose of generation is neither generation nor action, but the production of works that are to be contemplated. Is that true? Is that true? Come on, take a look. Begotten existences, being imitations of truly real beings, show that the purpose of generation is neither generation nor action, but the production of works that are to be contemplated. Yeah, because that's all... Give me an of, example. That's all the things that are, that are grown, begotten, that come to life, oh. and all of that's available to be seen on the internet now, oh. right? <laughs> what many people do in their garage. All of the work products and everything. What everything. are they? Everything. Everything. That's produced. Yeah. Either living or man-made. <laughs> But in what way is that last phrase true? Yeah. All of this imitation show that the purpose of generation is neither generation nor action, but the production of works that are to be contemplated. When you finish some project, what do you do? Hey, when you finish some project, you then look upon it, don't you? Now ah, you've got it, right? Mm -hmm. That's it. Ah, it's yours to come. Yeah. Right, there it is. But, but it has to be imitated. You don't want to let it go. It has to be. It has to be imitated in some way. They are. Imitations. Yeah, why? Well. Why? It, it's, it's, it's the contemplation of them, or you know, the contemplation of that, that hangs on them. <laughs> See, whatever man produces is dead. Right? Man's productions are dead. Whatever we make is dead. It doesn't go any further. See, in the chain of being, the realm of, in, of the intelligibles produce soul. Right? This is his model. Soul into soul and body. Soul and body produces things. What is lost, we do not produce any further life. It ends with us. Therefore, we are the end, the end at the bottom of the chain of being and life. <laughs> but whatever we produce is an imitation. Like, whatever you produce and you contemplate it, 
He's saying it's an imitation of real being. But what about children? Pardon? What about children? I do, uh, pardon? What about children? Is that the exception? It's well, you don't make them. We don't do that. I was talking about production. No matter how often you screw, you're not making a kid. <laughs> you know, by sticking the parts in and, you know, fitting them and hammering and tightening them, right? Or gluing them. Is that true? You know about this sort of stuff? Except for Pinocchio. Yes. Matter of fact, it often comes as a surprise, doesn't it? What? I'm a father! <laughs> the last thing you were contemplating. Last thing I was thinking of! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll get back to work. <laughs> contemplating! See? Contemplating. Right. Contemplation is aimed at by discursive reason. And below it, by sensation, whose end is knowledge. Further, beyond discursive reason and sensation, is nature, see, which bearing within itself an object of contemplation and rational form produces another rational form. Right. For him, nature, all nature, uh, Nature is, is uh, cycles of cycles of life, right? and uh, all of the order, right? all the shapes, all the patterns we find in nature, is that all of these come from rational principles in nature. or natural principles in nature, that's all. So just finish this one and we throw it open. Such, such are the arguments that developed in the course of this inquiry. Sir? Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Such are the arguments that developed in the course of this inquiry or that we recall from elsewhere. They ought now to be clear. It should be clear as well that since the supreme realities devote themselves to contemplation, all other beings must aspire to it, too, because the origin of all things is their end as well. Moreover, animals generate because of the activity within them of seminal reasons. Yeah, seminal reasons is the mark of nature. Seminal is like, like, associated with semen or something. Yeah, go ahead, you're doing it kind of a good Seriously. section. Animals generate because of the activity within them of seminal reasons. Generation is a contemplation. It results from the longing of pregnancy to produce a multiplicity of forms and objects of contemplation, to, for, to fill everything with reason and never to cease from contemplation. Begetting means to produce some form, and this means to spread contemplation everywhere. All the, fa all the faults met with in things begotten or in actions are due to the fact that one strayed from the object of one's contemplation. The poor workman is the producer of bad forms. Lovers also must be counted among those who contemplate and pursue forms. But enough of this. No. Se in seminal this. reasons may be connected with semen, as I think you're quite right. Yeah. But in the text, this is only logoi. logoi. Mm -hmm. It's the interpretation of translator that makes it seminal yeah. reasons. Oh, I just, more thought. What is logoi? Logos. Logoi. Plural of logos. Oh, it's a plural. Yeah. Nah. More. No, I just I've been puzzling and I'm puzzling out why he's using. It's very interesting how he uses it in the opening sections of this mm -hmm. and how he's using it here. It just it's very puzzle. It's just puzzling to me that logos. You know that an analogy comes from logos. Logos is taken mm -hmm. as a reason. Mm -hmm. And here it said, um, the, the, the quote that um, <clears throat> Ingmar was referring to, because I know he's interested in uh, Greek, you know, it says, moreover, animals generate because of the activity within them of seminal mm -hmm. reason. Here, okay. Okay. The, the translation is, for when living things produce, it is the rational principles, the logos, mm -hmm. within them, which, which move them. 
This is kedusa, which moves them. And this is an activity of contemplation. The birth pain of creating many forms and many things to contemplate and filling all things with rational principles. So, it's a, that's again logoi, logo, you know, so... It's a major... I don't know what to think of it. You know, I just... I'm just baffled. <laughs> No, this, the, this, is her, no, this is Heraclitus. Mm-hmm. And Logos, the idea of Logos. Logos is that which it runs through all of nature. It's, it's the rational form that runs through all nature. And that's, he's, he's, he's right into it. And it, this use of it occurs throughout this work, right? I mean, but this one paragraph, right? In a way, he's uh, he's uh, getting ahead of himself, but it's a good paragraph. It should be clear as well that since the supreme realities devote themselves to contemplation, all other beings must ad- must aspire to it too, because the origin of all things is their end as well. And Pierre, when they're saying end, they're not talking about end in the definitive sense, but a goal. More than an end, so to speak. It's both. Well, push it. See, this is where we're getting into now the intelligible. Right. Now, the key, <clears throat> the key expression of what the what he means by intelligibles. Uh, The most brilliant light of being is the intelligible. <clears throat> what does that mean? That means when, if you want to read people who experience this, they're going to say that this is the way it manifested itself, but what they encounter is something so real that anything by comparison is only an imitation or a a mere appearance. It's so real that all else in their experience is thought of, judged, as appearance. Now look here, the same logic In that experience, they see it as so real, see, as, watch, as something that is that is truly real. Therefore, they reach truth. Ah, look here. They see this as such a magnificent experience that this also can be called the perfection of beauty. Because anything by contrast is only the appearance of beauty. Everything else by contrast is only an appearance of beauty. Therefore, this is a perfection of beauty. Hey, but the thing they encounter is not dead. Right? But has a vast vitality to it, in the same way that all else may be said to be alive, but nothing like the vitality in that experience. So what? Well, it is also has the, the strange quality of being dynamically dynamic, turning upon itself. Right? So it is. The insults, there's something that is seeing, 
encountering that's not the eyes or the senses. So we call it some new eye, eye of the soul. Another word for that is intellect. So the, the intellect is intellecting, activity of intellecting, the intelligible. The intellect is intellecting the intelligible. No difference. Right? Sight is the eye seeing something. The eye is different from the seeing and the seen, or object of sight. This is always different, then two, three, different. Hearing, all of the senses. Right? All of the senses, one, two, three, one, two, three, always different. Here, you can't make that division, though you can make the distinction, they ain't different, because they're all hyphenated. So, what is this? Look at what is this in terms of the experience? Contemplation. <clears throat> Therefore, the nature of reality is contemplating. Hey, you know what? <clears throat> Pretty hot experience, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Therefore, all other beings aspire to it. Huh? Anyone who hears about this would sure as hell want wanted part, want to participate in it. Is that true? Huh? Even for people in Brooklyn? <laughs> Big question. <laughs> if so, even for them, it's true for the rest of us, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Except for yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So notice the way he pulls it together. It should be clear as well that since the supreme realities devote themselves to contemplation, all other beings must aspire to it too. Because the origin of all things is their end as well. Because whatever we aspire for, by the way, a startling to this is an, another word which we haven't used but we need, uh, astonishing as it may be, in all of this, one recognizes a true goodness. <laughs> and since all people aspire for what they think is good, this is the very nature of goodness. Another name for the same thing. And if you want to talk about how, that, how this manifests itself in the universe, that's the problem of a word we don't use, providence, <coughs> right, which has 24 categories. I, I, I had a problem with something. I'd like to know what, you call, what is nature and mother nature? Mm -hmm. The two, because I had a conversation with someone about nature, and they said mother nature, good old mother nature, which they use the American term a lot, which um, I really didn't like it too much for it to say, well, mother nature, you can just stand to an end of the cliff and fall off. You know, that's supposed to be mother nature. You know, well, so that's not nothing good about human nature. Mm -hmm. So what is nature? Go ahead. You would say, come on, respond, quick. Good point. Come on, who wants to push it, Barbara? Well, they have a, you know, in section what is it? Section one, section two. They have a like four lines. Three, four, say. five. That's where he goes into that right here. Okay. That's right. Okay, push one more step. I like this uh, great line. Um, all the faults within things begotten or in actions are due to the fact 
that one strayed from the object of one's contemplation. Right? All error. <laughs> hey, you strayed. Hey, you put your mind somewhere else and goofed. Yeah. I like to read pretty well when I read. And Go I, ahead. And, and I noticed that happening while I was reading. The second I started thinking about something else, like there was a fault in the way I felt like I was reading. So, you want me to continue into eight? I thought you were going to go on to the next sentence, which is equally good. Oh, okay. Um, the poor workman is the producer of bad forms. Lovers also must be counted among those who contemplate and pursue forms. But enough of this. Right, right. So poor workmen, they produce bad forms. And lovers must be counted among those who contemplate and pursue forms. And that's why uh, Playboy is so popular. Right. Well, aren't those who buy it and look at those pictures uh, pursuing uh, forms? Any lover. And contemplating them? I buy it for the articles. <laughs> what? There's printing on those yeah, magazines? Some, some I never knew that. <laughs> that was a famous line. Here with that, with that line about lovers be related to their in the favors that uh, Socrates is talking about the types of lovers, where he says those of the highest philosophical type who refrain, and this is the implication from physical context mm -hmm. of that love create, you know, their wings and their their rise to the maximum possibility of their form, you know, as it moves into the higher, you know, realms. Is that, you know, what he's kind of talking about here is is that one line is saying the which is expanded on the Phaedrus about the importance of love being the engine that expands the wings and the wings, the wings for our return yeah, and to contemplate you know, the <coughs> higher states of the intelligible. Yeah, as a matter of fact, it would be good if uh, we could get most of you to do some extra work and do uh, Socrates' second speech in the Phaedrus to continue this work. Let's do it. And we don't mind if other people work, do we? Especially no, no. And it's a magnificent dialogue, but uh, yeah. but that's, that's, oh, that's right. like See, including mm -hmm. each each of the souls, of course, must follow the gods which would that they identify with, and they go along through nine divisions and ten divisions. Yeah. So on our own. Okay. All right. Okay. Now we go into metaphysics. Right? <laughs> yep. Agree? But first I need something to drink. I'm drying up. So we'll go to eight. Eight is the transition. Eight and nine. And that's where we're going. So let me take a break. Oh, no. Contemplation <laughs> rises from nature to the soul, from soul to the intelligence. At each stage, it is more intimately the contemplator's own. Beautiful piece of work. Beautiful. In a person already wise, knower and known are one, <coughs> since he aspires to the intelligence. Clearly, in the intelligence, subject and object are one. This identity is more than a close association, such as we find in the best of souls, because it is the same thing to think and to be. And that's an old translation problem, but that comes from Parmenides, of course. In the intelligence, we no longer have the object of contemplation and the other that which contemplates <clears throat> where that's so 
we would need another principle where the difference no longer exists. In the intelligence, the two things are one. This means that living contemplation who is not object. by it. Therefore, if the object of contemplation is to be alive, it must no longer be with the life of a, a planet or an animal or any other animate existence. That's mm. psych but mm. obscurity, which is the question. How is a life of complete clarity? Now I added to that. But the life of which it is question now is a life of complete clarity, which is really luminous. It is the highest life and the highest intellection identified. <clears throat> the highest life is the highest thought. Lower life, lower thought. Lowest of lives, lowest of thoughts. Every life of, of, of this is a thought. Men readily distinguish the various kinds of life, but do not do the same with thought. They call some things thought and others not because they, because they do not try to find out what life really is. This discussion again shows us that all things are contemplation. If the truest life is life through thought and is identical with the truest thought, then the truest thought must be alive. Then contemplation and the object of this contemplation are alive and they are life and they're identical. Right? Same thing we were saying here. Since the two are identical, how does it happen that their unity becomes multiplicity? Right. Now we have a, a pause, a reflection, and I have a note here for Barbara to read. What note did you want me to read? Oh, actually, I wanted to point out something. Please. Where you were reading, all life is thought thought of greater or less obscurity, as is life itself, but the life of which it is questioned, <clears throat> but the life of which it is questioned now is a life of complete clarity. It's just that is our old term from the Republic, the bright shining pattern, that's the term <laughs> in our gaze, which means uh, to be, could be said to be self-luminous, mm -hmm. only this is the superlative form, which would be like the most, self-luminous or brilliant thing. So, I wanted to mention Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Thanks. Keep going. Uh, where do you want me to read from? Where you left off? The intelligence does not contemplate unity. The intelligence does not contemplate unity. For even when it contemplates the one, it does not contemplate it as a unity. Otherwise, there would be no intelligence. It begins by being one, it does not remain one. Unconsciously, it becomes multiple, as if pressed down by its own weight. It unfolds itself, desirous of becoming all things, though it would have been, although it would have been better for it not to have desired this, because thus it became the second hypo hypostasis. It deploys itself like a circle, which in its deployment becomes figure and surface, circumference, center, radii, higher and lower points. The higher whence come the radii being the better, and the lower whence the radii extend being the less good. The originating center is not equivalent to both center and circumference, nor the two to center alone. In other words, the intelligence is not the thought of a single thing, but is universal, and being universal, it is the thought of all things. It must be all things and think all things. Each of its part contains all things, and it is all things because otherwise the intelligence would contain a part that was not intelligence. It would then be composed of non-intelligences and be a conglomeration of things that were waiting to become the intelligence to achieve completeness. Therefore, the intelligence is infinite. When something proceeds from it, there is no impoverishment, neither for what proceeds, since it also is all things. 
nor for the intelligence whence it proceeds, since the intelligence is not composed of juxtaposed parts. Push, push this into uh, cosmology. All right. Okay, Zeus. All right. There's an idea in the mind of God. And again, Zeus contemplates it, and on that basis, all the cosmos is created. So this is the copy, this is the model. Now here, variety, vast variety of living things. And us, in the time is, and us. <clears throat> because we are not just in nature, but part of us is able to have this kind of experience and therefore there's a kinship between us and anything that's able to participate in this experience. Now here's the problem. <clears throat> if that's the model, and this is the manifestation of the model, then <clears throat> The, the theoretical problem for the philosopher is, or anyone who wants to play this game, is how can this, right? Now the word idea, of course, means to behold, right? It's not the same thing as a concept. Right? So to behold this, this is a capital I. Right? How can this be the cause of this? And he's going to say that all of this, in that one paragraph, <clears throat> he's trying to now bring it together. The intelligence, same thing here, is the idea in the mind of God. The intelligence is not the thought of a single thing, but it's universal, okay? And being universal, it is the thought of all things. See, the word thought is bad. It's the idea of all things. It must be all things and think all things. These are all things. It must think all things if that's what it's if that's what it does and that's what it's doing. Each of its parts contains all things. And it's all things because otherwise the intelligence would contain a part that was not intelligence. Okay. Look here. If each part contains all things, then each we could add to it, but as each thing emerges in creation or nature,
it manifests only a part in time. Right, because what's missing in this creation? This is universal. You know what's missing? Time. See? So there has to be in this process, he has to account for this curious thing called time. This can be eternal. This can be eternity. All that is, always. So therefore, for he says, therefore, Time is the moving image of eternity. Therefore, in the whole course of the cosmos, right, if one can take all of it and jam it together into one instant, that would be each part contains all things, all things can be collapsed into one thing, one thing contains all things, it's all either compact or spread out over an infinity of time. To explain that, that's the problem. That's the problem. And uh, that's what Chardin tries to do, you know, Pierre de la uh, Chardin, Tillier Ch Chardin. Which work? Huh? <coughs> Phenomenology of Man. One of them. He's got several, but he's, he's probably the mo most creative thinker of them all. You know about him? You know yeah, about him? Phenomenology. I rather. How come you don't know about him? I do. I read. I read. Can you imagine that? Wouldn't you expect? Look, let's take a look at him. Wouldn't you expect <laughs> he's the kind of a guy that would? Oh, oh, yeah, I would say too. Okay, I read him. Next time you'll talk about him. I'll bring the book. You'll bring the book with and give us a talk on Chardin. With notes. All right. <laughs> and if you need any help, yeah. call on. anyone. Okay. Here. Good. You. All right. You laugh first. You're, you're appointed. You'll work with my colleague over there? Go I can laugh for you anytime. Would a, would a possibility be the, the issue of how each part has the whole in it be sort of a... Uh, hologram. The idea that Socrates brings up about how there is an identity between the gods and their manifestation of the soul in the sense that in every soul as as a individual part of the cosmos, that there is a, a complete <coughs> signature, you know, of the whole. Well, that may be that. I'm having trouble putting those two ideas together, but you are making the point that to move from this to this presupposes the creation of soul. Well, yeah, but no. Okay. No. But uh, Plotinus doesn't talk about that. No, uh, not here. Oh, okay. Uh, we're going to go there later. Oh, okay. Remember, we skipped that whole section on soul. That's right. Okay. That's where we're All right. All okay. Right. Okay. Therefore, the intelligence is infinite. When something proceeds from it, there's no impoverishment, neither from what proceeds or etc. Right. Good. We quit at nine. nine. So we'll go nine, ten, and eleven. And then we'll have fun by going through one, two, three, four, five and see how he then applies it to nature. Sir? One quick question. So within this cosmology, what, how does providence fit within this? Providence. Fit ah! That's that's worth a, at least a half hour. Oh, all right. <laughs> no, but the idea of providence is this idea <clears throat> manifesting itself. This is the same as this. All of this 
as this. In time. Uh, the, by the God. How the goodness of this uh, in, into creation is, is the idea of providence. The transmission of goodness. 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 Manifestation, transmission, communication of that goodness is called providence. Yes. That's a formal name for it. So it's almost like it's almost like a force in nature. No, no. Too late. Yeah. As a matter of fact, providence doesn't proceed into nature. It only proceeds into in, to intelligent beings. The idea of providence. Yeah. Because if the object must be able to understand the messages that are coming providentially. That, that, that's a whole, whole thing. You got time. That's a, formally, formally. It takes 24 good categories to explore within another world of discourse. You got a good question.